Okay, maybe we should start now and uh, maybe Jiawen will catch up rather fast. Okay, uh, so today we uh, uh, very happy to have uh, Nick Wright from uh, the University of Southampton, uh, who will speak about case theory for exceptional extended affine wire groups. Uh, let's welcome. Well, um, uh, let me begin by saying thank you very much uh, for inviting me and to, you know, for organizing the, the series of seminars. Um, I think it's great that we can continue to sort of meet and discuss mathematics, even, you know, even if we can't actually meet in person. Um, <clears throat> Uh, of course, these things always still make me very slightly nervous with the technology, but fingers crossed everything will work okay. So I'm sort of sharing from my iPad. So uh, uh, hopefully this will all, uh, all, all run smoothly. Um, I should begin by saying this is a joint work with Graham Niblo and Roger Plyman. Um, I should probably have put that in my abstract when I sent that out. So apologies to Roger and Graham for not saying that in the abstract. Um, uh, okay, so... I, I want to sort of, I, I'm going to begin by um, sort of giving a little bit of an overview of the, the area, you know, because uh, I'm sort of not assuming that everyone is completely familiar with the idea of uh, affine vial groups and extended affine vial groups and so on. Um, uh, so just as a sort of a, a little bit of motivation, um, and this is kind of where we came into the, the subject, um, uh, particularly myself and Graham, we were thinking about the 333 triangle group. Um, so the 333 triangle group, what is that? Well, it's just the group generated by these, these three reflections that I've got drawn here. Um, uh, I mean, if you want to write it uh, as a presentation, it's generated by three elements, S1, S2, S3. They're reflections, so they're squares of one, and, and the product of SI, SJ um, uh, has Q1 when I is not equal to J, or indeed when I is equal to J as well, right? but, uh, uh, of course, because when I is equal to J, SI squared is one. Um, now, an alternative way of thinking of that group um, uh, is, well, so there's sort of a number of things you can do. We've got a presentation that sort of makes it a cox of the group. Um, uh, and it's, uh, you know, in fact, it's actually um, an affine vial group. Uh, it's the, the A2 tilde affine vial group. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's a crystallographic group, which is to say that uh, you can, Think of it alternatively as uh, in the way that I've got here um, as, as being uh, uh, the lattice Z squared uh, semi direct product with, with the uh, group S3 here. Um, so I've, I've added three points in here, and those are three points in, in the lattice. Um, the point is, of course, that if I if I reflect on this line and then on this line or, or the other way around, what I, what I get, I, I get a translation by by this vector here. Um, uh, uh, and of course, you know, similarly, I can get translations here or, or here. Um, I should say, of course, the reason that this one's in, in the group is that this is, this is given by uh, S, you know, this is say S1, S2, this would be S1, S2, S1, right? We'll give, we'll give you this one here. Um, <clears throat> so the, we, we've got this Z squared, that, that's the, the translational part. I mean, obviously you only need two of these three vectors. Um, uh, I mean, you might wonder why I've denoted the vectors in this way with, with one minus one zero, et cetera. Um, uh, in a certain sense, that's convenience, right? Of course, it's in two dimensions, but because of the triangular nature of things, the coordinates are just much more convenient if instead of using the x, y plane, use the x plus y plus z is zero plane in, in our cute. Um, uh, now, the thing is, of course, this putting this into the into the context of, of um, the vial groups and so forth. The point is that each of these these three reflections that we see there is the reflection in a line perpendicular to each of these three vectors. Okay, so the the setup of uh, of vial groups, you have roots, which is in this case these three three vectors here and then you have reflections which where you where you negate that one vector and preserve the the orthogonal complement um uh so in terms of what's what's going on if i take the plane and i quotient by this action here um the the z squared action the lattice has as its fundamental domain this hexagon here 
Um, if you think about it, the hexagon is is just all points which are closer to zero, the origin, than they are to any of the other three points, or indeed anything else in the lattice. And so translating these hexagons around, of course, tiles the plane. Those are the fundamental domains for the z-squared part. Um, <clears throat> this hexagon, of course, gives us really a torus. You, you, you identify opposing pairs of sides, and that's that's the plane mod z squared giving you the torus. So, of course, you might you know you might think it's somehow more natural for the torus to use um, uh, sort of a uh, uh, you know use a rhombus or something as the fundamental domain. But the hexagon is just sort of gives you a very nice picture of this. Um, uh, and it's a particularly nice picture because the way that the the S three part acts um, uh, is is it's well it's these three reflections here um, uh, and so the quotient now just gives us a triangle. Uh, hence, you know, if you like the name, the three 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 triangle group. Um, <clears throat> now, from coming at it from sort of a bam con point of view, what one might want to know is what is the group C star algebra here. Um, uh, and of course, the point is that the group C star algebra is given by, well, thinking of this picture here, um, I have the group C star algebra of Z squared, which is functions on the torus, um, uh, and then acted upon by S3. Um, so once again, I've got a torus with an S3 acting on it. And it's very tempting to think it's the same as the torus here with the S3 acting on it, but it's not. And that's kind of, we, we, sort, of, we, we sort of wrote this down and we thought, well, okay, Surely this action on the torus is that action on the torus, right? You would think. Um, uh, but the answer is it's not. Um, so translating it back into something that looks like the triangle group, of course, the functions on the torus, uh, that's Marita equivalent to functions on the plane, you know, um, cross product by z squared. Uh, and so basically what we have is we have a group, which again is a z squared semi-direct product S3 acting on the plane. But it's not the same group. That's the that's the sort of maybe slightly surprising thing. I mean, once you've seen it a few times, you you cease to be surprised by it. But um, you know, if you've not seen it before, it seems a little surprising. Um, what's different about this is, if you like, is the z squared. The s three is still doing what it was doing before, but the z squared, as well as it, it's a finer lattice than we had before. So we we've got the vertices uh, of at the corners of the hexagon as well now. The result is that the fundamental domain is now this smaller hexagon, and of course you can now see why the picture is actually somehow fundamentally different. Because originally in the hexagon, we were reflecting in lines that go through the corners, but now we're reflecting in, in, in edge bisectors. <clears throat> so what the bound con isomorphism tells us in this case is that the, the equivariant K homology for our original group G is given by the K theory of the, um, sorry, equivalent K homology, if I didn't say that, um, it's given by the K theory of a cross product, but by a slightly different group. It, they're both acting on R squared in slightly different groups. Um, and the explanation of that, in some sense, is Langland's duality. OK, so let me now say a little bit about vial groups. Um, the context that we're in here, we want to think about Lie groups, which are compact, connected, semi-simple Lie groups. And the point is that these are, these are ones which have a real Lie algebra as opposed to a complex Lie algebra. Um, if I take the maximal torus in the Lie group, of course, that, you know, so already we have a torus appearing as we did before, and the Lie algebra is then just sort of, I feel like, an R to the N over that torus. Um, and the vial group can be can be thought of, or you know, in some sense, this is the definition of the vial group, but of course, it can also be con constructed, as I mentioned, by taking these reflections. The, the vial group, you take the normalizer of the torus and mod out by the torus. Okay, and that gives you a finite group uh, that acts on the torus. And of course, because it acts on the torus, um, differentiating it, we get an action on the Lie algebra as well. Um, uh, and so that, that action on the Lie algebra here is, it, you know, is in that previous example, um, that would be just this these reflection in three lines through the origin. So that, that's the finite group, the S3 that we had. Um, the other data that we have floating around, we have the group of characters on the torus. Um, and we also have co-characters. So a, a character is a map from the torus, well, to the circle, um, a 
group homomorphism, um, uh, and co-characters are maps in the other direction, from group homomorphisms from the circle back to the torus. Um, but you can also think of that as just giving you the fundamental group, because a loop in the torus you know, is, is going to give you a generator from the fundamental group, or an element group, fundamental group. Um, uh, or alternatively, in sort of in terms of the Lie algebra, of course, there's, there's the exponential map gives this the quotient from the Lie algebra to the torus, and the kernel of that is exactly this lattice x star here. Um, now, x upper star is a lattice in T as well. So x lower star, if you think of it as the kernel of the exponential map, of course that sits inside T. x upper star perhaps less naturally so, um, but it is uh, for the following reason. The, the, the point is that, as we said, the, the, the torus T is the quotient of the Lie algebra by the lattice x lower star, the co-characters. And so the characters on the torus can be identified with characters on the Lie algebra, which are one on x star. And of course, characters on the Lie algebra, they're given by complex exponentials. Um, uh, but those complex exponentials have an inner product with again something else in the Lie algebra. Uh, so an element of the Lie algebra will give us a character which is one on the whole of x star precisely when we get integer pairings. Okay, so we want things you know that that have integral pairing with x lower star, and that's the sense in which x upper star and x lower star are dual to one another. That you have a perfect pairing between these two lattices. Okay, so each of them is the is the dual in terms of homomorphisms to Z. Um, <clears throat> so now let's let's talk about roots. I sort of mentioned them briefly when we were thinking about the the triangle group example. Um, the vial group can be described by its root system. Okay, so we have a set of, uh, of vectors in the Lie algebra called roots, and in fact they they sit inside the the, the lattice of characters. Um, uh, and we also have something called dual roots, uh, and these are just the roots, but sort of rescaled in this in this funny way. Um, uh, un under nice circumstances, i.e. where you can take all your roots to have the same length, then we can just make the convention that our roots all have length square root of two. Um, and that means, therefore, that our roots and our co-roots are basically just the same thing. Okay, so you can't always do that. Um, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but, you know, when, when you can, of course, you should do that because it just makes life rather simpler. Um, and... As I said, each, each root vector defines a reflection, the reflection that negates the root vector and preserves the perpendicular, um, the perpendicular hyperplane to that root vector. Uh, and as a formula, you can say, well, what does that reflection do? It takes V and it subtracts off the inner product of V with the co-root times the root. And of course, this is set up in just such a way that if V is equal to the root R, then I get r minus 2r, so r gets negated. But of course, anything that's orthogonal to r is also orthogonal to our check, um, uh, and therefore uh, will be preserved by this. Um, and then the vial group is simply the group generated by these reflections. So you know, in, as, as we saw in the 333 triangle group case, we have these, these three points, which were our roots, and the, those, go, those gave us the three reflections. Um, so the key properties that a set of roots must have are, are the following. Um, it, that they're supposed to span the Lie algebra T. Um, they're supposed to be closed under these reflections. So if I take one root and reflect it using, well, of course, if I reflect it using itself, I, I negate it. So of course, we see right away that at any time there's a root there, you just have minus the root. But it should also be the case that if I reflect it by a different root, I, I remain in there as well. So I only drew three roots before, but there were really six in that case because you have plus or minus each of those roots. Um, we should have an inter integral pairing between these things. Um, that's, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, of course, is basically saying that the co-roots sit, you know, the roots sat in the characters and the co-roots sit in the co-characters. Um, uh, and as I said, if a root is in there, then minus it should be in there as well, but that should be the only multiple. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's some, some people don't in, impose that and say it's reduced if this is satisfied. Um, 
so now we come on to Langland's duality. If I have a Lie group G, we've got we've built these four things, right? We've got the, the characters and the co-characters and the roots and the co-roots, and those things together give us something that's called the root data. Okay, so it's it's a bit more information than just knowing the roots, right? If I just know the roots, that tells me something, but it doesn't necessarily tell me what these lattices are. And the definition of the Langlands dual of, of G is simply that, well, I, I exchange the roles of X upper star and X lower star and correspondingly exchange the roots and the co roots. Okay, so I'm swapping the lattices and I'm swapping the roots over. Um, <clears throat> now, as I said, you, you can, if, if all your roots have the same length, then your roots and your co roots will really be the same thing. Um, so actually, from that point of view, in, in that context, it's the it's the change of the lattice which is which is crucial. The other thing to notice is that the vial group is given by the reflections by each root, but that that reflection depends not on the length of the root, but just its direction. So swapping roots for co roots doesn't change anything. So you might I mean that this sounds like Langlands duality isn't doing very much, right? Um, uh, so the 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 cases where we can take five checks to be equal to five is sort of everything except these ones. Um, so the, the classification, we, you have the series A and B and C and D and then you have the various exceptional cases. Um, uh, and the, again, if you're not so familiar with these, these diagrams, the, 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 the sort of arrows here are, are telling you which roots have length greater than which other roots. So, you know, in, in the AM case, for instance, the roots all have the same length, okay? And that, that's why the BN and CN are a little bit different to, to the other ones. And of course, what we see is that Langland's duality, because it's going to, because we, we change the length of the root in this way, um, uh, what's going on here is that it's going to swap the BN and CN cases, okay? Um, uh, in a certain sense, you might say it doesn't really change the, the F4 and G2 because, you know, when I reverse the direction, I just have G2, but the other way around. So in terms of the actual Lie group, it, group itself, the, the AN case, the, the associated Lie group that we're talking about would be, for instance, SUN. And so we have the group SUN. But of course, we've also got the group P of SUN, which locally looks exactly the same. If you projectivize, you're just quotienting. Okay, so the Lie algebra behaves the same, the Val group behaves the same. Um, but what's going to happen is you've, you've made you've changed the size of your maximal torus, and correspondingly, you've changed the, the number of characters and co-characters. And that's exactly what Langman's duality does in that case. So just to kind of have something at the back of your mind, you might think about SUN versus PSUN. Um, so that's that's the AM case. Um, the the BNs and CNs, as I said, you dualize between the two, and that's that's swapping you between um, SON and the symplectic groups um, with N being odd. And if S, if if N is even, SON gives you the DNs here. Um, so in in the DN case again, if I take SON, that's actually Langland's dual to itself, but above. We have something above it and below it. I can I can quotient by the minus the identity because in, in the even case that that is um, in SON. Right? That's, that's why it matters that we're even. So so it, it it covers something with index two. It's also got an index two cover, which is the spin group. And so Langland's duality in that case it preserves SON, but it swaps um, the spin group with with the PS. Um, <clears throat> this point about basically taking something in the center and quotienting by it, that's that's sort of, again, a general thing in Langlois duality. You always have a Lie group which is simply connected, which sits right at the very top. And if I quotient by the center of that, I now get a new Lie group, which has no center, and that's, that's referred to as adjoint type. Uh, and that's then sort of at the bottom, if you like, and Langlois duality exchanges those. Um, so what's the what's the affine vial group? Well, rather simply, the affine vial group is the um, is the group that's generated by the vial group uh, along with the co-characters. Um, for the Langlands dual, 
What's changed? Well, the, the vial group stays the same, but the lattice has changed. And that's exactly what we saw in this triangle group example at the beginning, that we're changing the lattice, but keeping the vial group the same. <clears throat> and so let's think about G as SU3. Um, so for SU3, I should say SU3 is the A2 case as a shift by one. Um, the, the point is that the maximal torus here is, is, a, is a torus of, of rank two, right? The maximal torus is given by diagonal elements of uh, modulus one whose product is one. Um, I, should, I should really have said mod A, mod B, mod alpha, mod beta, mod gamma are all one here. Yeah. Um, so here's the picture, and this is the picture that we drew before. Um, the, the lattice of co-characters here is given by, well, the, the, the Lie algebra of this thing will now be x, y, z, whose sum is zero, which of course was our picture of the plane, those are our coordinates in the plane. Um, <clears throat> the co-characters uh, will be precisely integer valued things in, in whose sum is zero. Uh, and that's the lattice given by these three points here. Uh, and then the vial group is the reflections given by those three lines. Um, uh, and therefore, what we get here is the extended affine vial group is exactly the 333 triangle group. Um, <clears throat> you might wonder when, why the word extended is here instead of just affine vial group. Um, the extended, the, the affine vial group is, a, is really just a special case of the extended affine vial group. Um, and, and, and it's basically the affine vial group in the simply connected case. So in, in this setup, this actually is the affine vial group because SU3 is simply connected. Um, so affine and extended affine are the same. But when I pass to the Langlands dual, so that means I go from SU3 to PSU3, um, then the extended affine vial group is genuinely different. See the torus now. I'm I, I'm have to mod out by the center. Okay, so uh, if you like, I take alpha beta gamma to be equal to one, and then I mod out by cube roots of unity. Um, so the center is just multiples of, of the identity here. Um, but of course, I, I I it doesn't matter if I take PSU three or PU three. They're the same thing, right? Uh, and so I can just, if you like, think of it as being well. I take all alpha beta and gamma, but then I mod out by all diagonal matrices, delta, delta, delta. Um, and so the, the co-characters here, um, uh, sorry, the characters, these were the co-characters before. Um, the characters, again, we have a sum zero condition, but they don't actually have to be integer. All that matters, because they're supposed to have integer pairing with these ones, all that matters is that the difference between them is integral. Um, and so that includes these guys here, right? You, you, you'll, you'll notice that, that I've got two thirds and minus a third. So the difference is, is one here. So it's integer. Um, <clears throat> so this thing is, is uh, the, the extended F1 vial group is, is, is that second group that we had at the beginning, which um, uh, I, I, I refer to it as the cone group. The reason for calling it the cone group is that what you're really doing with the, your triangle is you're quotienting by the cyclic tree rotation. So you get this, this code picture. Um, <clears throat> and so here's the, here's the big theorem, or a big theorem. Um, uh, this, is, this is what um, uh, Graham Roger and I proved a few years back, uh, is that the baum con conjecture, just, just in general, if you have an extended affine vial group, the bound con conjecture is here. Um, the left-hand side can be identified as the cohomology of the extended affine bar group acting on, uh, I mean, the, the, the E bar that appears in, in bound con is, is just the Lie algebra here. Um, so you can identify this as the cohomology of the extended affine bar group acting on, on the Lie algebra. Um, but the, uh, on the other hand, the right-hand side, you can identify that with the K-theory of this other extended affine bar group. It's not the original one, but rather the Langland's dual. And moreover, there's a, a Poincaré duality in KK theory. So a Poincaré duality in the sense of, of Alain Conn, so you get a, two elements in KK theory, and you, you, you do Kasparov product to get from here to here and, and from here back to here. 
Um, one of the things that's sort of nice about this is that, um, uh, you know, of course, in, in BAMCON, we, we always know what the map this way is, but, but the inverting it, of course, is the hard bit. Whereas in the Poincaré duality setup, um, of course, the map from here back to here is, is rather more explicit. There's a specific KK element we compare with to achieve this. Um, <clears throat> now, if you actually want to compute any of these K theory groups, well, um, the it, of course you can, if you like, you can work out very much by hand what does what does this algebra look like, um, and you can try to compute it. But if you want to do something a bit more general, um, uh, then what you can do is you can apply the equivariant churn character of Baum and Con to say that. Um, the K theory of, of this thing here, um, which if, if you like, you're sort of trying to do some kind of equivariant K theory, um, uh, equivariant over the, the finite vial group. Um, uh, so the equivariant shown character of Baum and Kohn basically tells you that you can work this out by, by looking at what's called the extended quotient. Okay, so the extended quotient um, is, well, what we do is we take pairs gx where gx is equal to x. Um, so we're we're sort of blow, we're trying to sort of blow up the isotropy. Where wherever I've got a fixed point, I want to sort of repeat it. Um, and then the extended quotient is that I take this and I mod out by the action of g. Uh, or of course, I have to still tell you what is the action of g here. And the point is that the action of G, so if I take an element H in G and I act on the pair GX, what I'm going to do, of course, I can't just act on the X because I, I might get something that's not fixed by G anymore. But if I conjugate G by H, um, then of course, G to the H fixes HX. Um, so that's still in this, in this inertia space. And, and that's the action that we're taking. Now, because this action conjugates the Gs, um, if I want to understand the quotient, I really only need to take one G from each conjugacy class. Um, so I take one representative of each conjugacy class because you know if, if I have a G prime that's conjugate to G, I can, I can use the action to move from G prime back to G. Uh, and then of course you have to ask, well, what, what part of the group remains that's, that's still acting on this, right? I can't take something that, that conjugates G away from itself. So it's precisely the, the centralizer of G uh, that acts on the, the G fixed set. Okay, so you can, you can describe the extended quotient this way in terms of conjugacy class representatives. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so, oh, just a... Uh, little remark here. Note that you can, you can because the lattice part is acting freely, that doesn't contribute to the isotropy. So you can alternatively say, well, rather than working this extended quotient out, I just take the extended quotient of the torus by the vial group itself. So we're, we're taking a, a torus and quotienting by a finite group. Um, so in the in the AN case, or well, the, the AN minus one case is SUN. As we said, the dual of SUN is PSUN. But you can do, do more than that. If, if, if I have any factor of N, uh, then the, the cyclic group of kth roots of unity sits inside the center here. Um, and so we have not just one Langlands duality, but we have sort of a whole tower of them in general, right? So, um, you know, if if, um, if say n was six here, yeah, um, you'd have a duality between su six and um, uh, and psu six, but you also have a duality between the quotient by c two and the quotient by c three in the middle. Um, uh, and what we were able to do um, for some moderately complicated formula here, we were able to work out, uh, you know, I mean, we, we worked out a bit, actually in a bit more detail than this, but just up to, up to homotopy, the answer is you get some torus and you can say sort of what's the, what's the rank of the torus and it has some multiplicity. The y mu is just um, uh, some discrete set. And the thing to notice here is again, that, that this Langlands duality is preserving everything. So this is, there's some funny formula here, but just the thing to notice is that the Langlands duality swaps K with N over K. And we have a greatest common divisor going on there. 
And so it doesn't matter if I change the K and the N over K, I don't change anything. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now let me get on to the, the exceptional part of the talk. Um, so having, having done AN, of course, you might think about BN and CN and DN. Uh, and so we, we spent a little bit of time thinking about that as well. Um, but of course, and a very interesting question is what happens if you go to the exceptional case? So fundamentally, this is the question, right? So we're, I'm going to talk about the exceptional Lee group E6. Um, the question fundamentally that we want to answer is, if I take the extended quotient of the torus by the Weyl group, um, what does it look like? Okay, so E6 has this diagram here, okay? Um, uh, and what that's, I mean, what, what's that telling you? That's, that's telling you that, that it's generated by reflections in six roots, and it tells you the geometric relation between them, right? So the, the um, where there's no line between things, so R1 and R3, the roots are orthogonal to each other, and so the reflections commute. Um, where there's a line, it means that the angle between them is, is two thirds of pi, as we had in the 333 triangle group picture. Uh, and so they satisfy the braid relation that, you know, if I take S1, S2, S1, it's the same thing as S2, S1, S2. Okay. So our, our task is to work out the conducacy class representatives, to work out centralizers of each of those, and then to figure out the fixed sets. And of course, what is the action on this fixed set? Now, for conducacy classes, um, in, in the AN case, the, the VAL group is just permutations. And so the conjugacy classes simply correspond to partitions. Um, the question of what they correspond to in the in the E6 case is a bit more complicated, but fortunately Carter worked this out back in 1972. Um, so quite an old result here. Um, and basically what he did was he showed that conjugacy classes correspond to certain diagrams. Um, now, a, the, the simpler diagrams might be just sort of um, subsets of this diagram, uh, but this, you know, so um, uh, of, of course, with some equivalences. Uh, it's it, the, the braid relations tell you, of course, that, that the reflection in R1 and the reflection in R2 are conjugate to each other. Okay, so the, you know, the, a single point is a single point. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, in particular, Carter enumerates all the conjugacy classes uh, and also works out um, the order of those conjugacy classes, which tells you by um, a, you know, uh, <coughs> by the orbit stabilizer theorem, it tells you what the um, uh, the order of the uh, centralizer is as well. Um, so again, what's the what you know? What are the roots in E6? That these are the simple roots. Of course, there are, you know, they're not this is not all of the roots here, um, but they're the simple ones. In total, there are 72 roots. Uh, and as I said, we take our roots, that the roots all have the same length, so we will take them all to have length root two. Um, and that means that that our, our check is the same thing as R. Uh, and the when I take the inner product of two roots, if, if they're two distinct roots, um, oh, I guess I should say R not equal to plus or minus R prime, right? Uh, of course, far as minus R prime, it would be minus two. But if, if they're genuinely distinct roots pointing in different directions, uh, then either they're orthogonal, that's the inner product is zero, um, or they might be at this two thirds pi, or of course they might, you know, minus it, might put it at one thirds pi, so the, the inner product is plus or minus one. Um, now, if I take any connected sub diagram of the diagram, I'll, I'll get a, I'll get a root. So, for instance, I could take R one plus R two, that's a root, or I could take R two plus R three plus R four plus R six, which I call R T because, well, it's kind of a T shape. Um, uh, and you know, counting up, you'll find that gives you twenty five roots. Um, of course, it really gives you fifty because I can then take minus all of those. Um, but I can build more roots by just sort of adding roots together. And the, the key point is that if I have two roots whose um, inner product is minus one and I act with one, one root on the other, the answer will just be the sum of the two roots. 
Um, and because, of course, the set of roots has to be closed under, under the action of the vial group, that tells you that under those circumstances, the sum of roots is in there. Um, so here's the, you know, here's the biggest root you can possibly build. I take R1, twice R2, 3 R3, 2 R4, R5, and 2 R6. And here I've, I've written down minus that one. Um, it's convenient to put a minus in there. Um, so this is, this is minus the maximal root. And we can sort of add this into the diagram. We call this one R0. Um, and, and we can add it into the diagram in the sense that R0 here is orthogonal to all of these. So it's not connected to them. But it has inner product minus 1 with R6. That's, that's why we wanted the minus here. If, if we took the positive root, it would have inner product plus 1 with R6. So that, that, that's why we put the minus in there. And, and actually thinking about this extended version of the diagram, uh, which is actually the, uh, the diagram for the E6 tilde, um, the, the affine bell group, um, <clears throat> this, this diagram tells us a lot about you know, the, the bar group and sort of what we want to know about it. Um, <clears throat> so here, you know, uh, a, a, long, a long list here of conjugacy class representatives. These are the types as enumerated by Carter. So um, for instance, A1, that, that just means one point and, A, and A2 is two points connected by an edge and A1 squared is two points that are not connected and so on. Um, and, and they correspond to, well, you know, one generator, two generators that commute because the naught and one are orthogonal, two generators that don't commute, because um, uh, you know the north and six are adjacent in that diagram, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You, you then get some more sort of complicated things like the these d fours. So that's you know um, uh, you could for that just take um, uh, s two, s three, s four, uh, and s six, but it's sort of more convenient to take the these ones instead. Um, I should say that that T denotes the group element corresponding to that root R T that we mentioned a moment ago. Okay, this is not the complete list. Um, there's more over the page, uh, so quite a few of these things. Um, <clears throat> if we want to work out the centralizer, as I said, the conjugacy class size is given to us by Carter, and therefore the size of the centralizer is just given by well this number here, which is the size of the bar group, divided by the conjugacy class size. Now, there's always sort of an obvious part of the centralizer. Um, so for instance, you know, if I take the A1 case S0, um, S0 itself, of course, centralizes itself rather trivially. But because the R0 root is orthogonal to R1 up to R5, S1 up to S5 also um, commute with the S0. So th this, what you might call the, the obvious part, the part corresponding to the generators themselves, um, and, and if the generator factorizes into commuting parts as it does here, S0, S1, it's not just S0 times S1 that's in the centralized, but, but S0 and S1 themselves separately, uh, and then the orthogonal part. So there's always sort of an, an obvious elementary part, and then of course you're left asking, well, what's left over? Um, and as you can see, sometimes the answer is not a lot, and sometimes the answer is quite a lot. Um, uh, now, actually, in a lot of cases, um, you know, one can one can sort of explain this rather simply in terms of in terms of symmetries. Okay, so when I draw this diagram with with my my roots, including the R naught, that diagram has a, has an obvious D3 symmetry. Um, I, can, I can reflect over this line or this line or this line. Um, now the question is, can you know do those reflections that we see on the diagram, do they correspond to something that's actually happening inside the vial group? And the answer is more or less yes. If I take R0 and R3, and then I take R2 plus R3 plus R4, and R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4 plus R5, those are all orthogonal reflections. And so they all commute with each other. And so I can consider the product of, of all of these reflections. It doesn't matter what order I put them in, because they'll commute. And this, of course, is an involution because it's a product of commuting reflections. And if you work out what it does, 
it does more or less what our, what U1 does in this, is supposed to do in this picture, why I'm calling it U1. Um, it swaps R1 with R5, R2 with R4, and fixes these three. Except it doesn't quite fix everything, it negates everything, right? So it, it, it negates these three, and it negates and swaps those ones. Um, so the, the P here is, uh, is not a typo, but a joke, and they're projective symmetries. Um, uh, of course, similarly, we can define a U2 symmetry and, and a U3 symmetry, and, and those generate for us a, a dihedral group. And those symmetries very often are sufficient to understand the centralizer. Okay, so as, a, as an example of this, we think about the, the A1 cubed case, that means I'm supposed to pick three points, and the three points I pick are 1 and 5, because that's a lovely symmetric triangle here. The elementary part of the centralizer includes the R3, or the S3 as well, the reflection in the R3. And, and it includes that because that's orthogonal to all of those. Okay, so the, the end elementary part is, is this part. It has index 6 in ZW, and that index 6 is exactly those symmetries given by U1 and U2 here. Um, the, the U1 and U2, of course, they preserve the product of these points because, well, all we're doing is we're sort of swapping two of them over and they, they were commuting with functions. Um, and, and of course, it, it, it fixes this, this central point. So what you're left with is, is this thing, which is, is a permutation root product, um, uh, and, then, uh, and then times F3 here. Um, <clears throat> adding in some or all of the U1, U2, and U3, this accounts for the, the remainder of the centralizer, the non-elementary part, in lots of cases. I think this is this is eight of the cases. And sometimes it, it sort of almost does. So here's another example. Um, the A1 to the fourth case. So that's that's a bit like this one, but just very slightly more complicated. I'm throwing in this one in the middle as well. Um, now <clears throat> the the issue here is that the the of course, it, it certainly is true that U1 and U2 are in the centralizer because, again, um, if I do U1, I fix these two and swap those two over, and so it fixes this word, um, etc. That's not quite the whole thing, but the thing to note is that actually the this T element is also in the centralizer. That's that's not completely obvious, but it's it's not so hard to verify it, um, uh, and. So we now have actually a vial group of type D4. You see, if I take, let's leave out the U1 and U2, and I'll take these, these corners and then the sum of these roots. The sum of these roots is, a, is itself a root whose inner product with each of those is minus one. And so what you get is the D4 diagram. The D4 diagram is this T. You have a dot and then three things sticking up from it. Um, and that diagram has a natural D3 symmetry. N note the, you know, the D here is pipe D4 and the curly D here is dihedral, uh, hence the notation you know, just to distinguish the two. Um, so that sort of, again, that explains a lot of what's going on in, 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 in some sense. It doesn't quite give you all of it. You have to work a little bit harder in some cases. Um, one case where you do have to work a bit harder is the A2 cubed case which I think I'm not going to go through in full because um, I'm running out of time a little bit. Um, but it turns out that this is rather naturally described by a complex reflection group. Um, what, ha what happens is that um, the, the, you, you show that T times S3 is in the centralizer. S0, S6, and S5, S4 are sort of obviously in the centralizer because they, they centralize themselves and commute with the rest of it. Um, TS3 is also in the centralizer by this eigenvalues argument that I'm skipping over. And those are three elements of order three, and they generate what's called a complex reflection group. These were classified by Shepard and Todd. Um, so this is G25 in the classification. They're a bit like Coxeter groups, um, except that the generators don't have to have order two anymore. Okay, so the the point about a comp, you know, in a in a Coxeter group, you have reflections, but the reflection is basically a matrix, which has 
one eigenvalue minus one and all the rest of your eigenvalues are one. In the complex case, you want to say, well, I'm working over the complex plane. I have a matrix with one eigenvalue, which is a root of unity, in this case, a cube root of unity, because we've got elements of order three. And again, all of the other eigenvalues are one. Okay, uh, and the, the edges tell you, you know, once again, what what's the what's the angle, if you like, between those eigenvectors, um, and they they correspond to having the, the the same braid relations here. And again, you can verify that these satisfy that those pairs satisfy the braid relations. Um, so the the trick is to actually describe everything in a complex way, and what you do is you use the fact that. 1 plus w plus w squared is 0 um, uh, as a sum of linear maps. And that therefore, this linear map here um, is a square root of minus 1. That gives you a complex structure. And that allows you to see that the centralizer is, um, in this case, is this complex reflection group G25. So the last thing we need to talk about is fixed sets. Um, uh, and the the fixed set um so so of course the fixed set will depend on which which group we're actually looking at okay there are two groups of type e6 two league groups and that's that they're, they're related by langland's duality so we'll take the simply connected one the other one is given by quotient by the center which has order three here just like in the su3 to psu3 there's a quotient of order three now the key thing to realize is that the way that the vial group acts on the maximal torus is, is a conjugation, and therefore it's acting by group automorphisms. So the fixed sets aren't just subsets, they're subgroups. Um, so what we will get, we'll get a torus, uh, which is the component of the identity, and then we'll get some finite abelian group. So the, the task is to work out, well, what's the rank of this torus and what's the size of this group? Okay, and that's and that's what we can do. What we did, um, if we take the word length of our element W, not in terms of the original set of generators. So the var group is generated just by S one, S two, S three, S four, S five, S six. But we take all conjugates of those, which is to say all the reflections corresponding to all roots. Okay, so that that particular conjugacy class is very easy to understand. Um, that conjugacy class is size 36 because we had 72 roots, right? So you've got a plus root and a minus root that give you the same reflection. Um, so if I take the word length with respect to, to that set of all reflections, then what Carter tells us is that um, that counts the number of non one eigenvalues, or in other words, it, count, it tells you the rank of the matrix I minus W. Okay, so the kernel is then going to be six minus that, and the kernel gives us the fixed set in the Lie algebra, and this fixed set in the torus is the quotient of that, the, um, the identity component is, uh, <coughs> and therefore, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, I see there's a question in the chat, yeah. Um, oh, dear me, we've, uh, sorry, the the screen seems to have frozen. I'm, I'm not on page 14. Um, uh, I'm on page 16. So uh, I'm not quite sure what's happened with the screen share. I'm going to stop the sharing and reshare it. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the trouble with uh, the technology. Is it uh, it runs fine up to a point, and then all of a sudden it stops working. And uh, you know, that, that's it's very important that you're keeping track of where we're at. Right, give me a second. Okay, so so now we're on we're on this page. So um. Yeah, so sorry, when I was talking about complex reflection groups, um, there, there was there was some uh, there was a slide to go with that as well, but we've uh, uh, but sorry, I hadn't realized that the screen had had frozen there. Um, 
<clears throat> um, I can uh, I can share the slides after the talk if you want to kind of look look back at, at that. Um, but yeah, as, as I was saying, the, 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 the trick is to take our six dimensional real space and convert it into a three dimensional complex space by considering this this operator here. Um, yeah, so for the for the fixed sets, what we have we have um, as, as I said, we have a a, a torus. Um, which is the identity component and then a finite group. Um, and the rank of the torus is given by the, the kernel of the I minus W operator. Okay. Um, and so that rank is just given by six minus the word length. And that, that word length, of course, is, is very easy to work out because actually the way I've um, written all my generators um, uh, is as a product of, of such roots. Okay, so, so we can say what that is rather easily. Um, <clears throat> the, for the finite group, so if we're trying to work out the cardinality of that, the trick is to dualize again. So somehow the theme all the way through is that duality is, is magical, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> so, when I dualize this, um, uh, the, the, the result is, is that I get, um, because I'm quotienting here, um, I, I get characters that are supposed to be one on the identity component. But because I'm taking the W fixed set, that dualizes to say, well, I want to quotient out by I minus W times the lattice X star. And we have a theorem that lets us actually compute this. So what we do is we take the greatest common divisor of the determinants of the L by L minus of this. So think for a moment about what would happen if the length is six, which it is in some examples, right? In, in, in the length six case, this matrix is actually invertible. And so you just compute the determinant. But of course, if my matrix is not invertible, I can't compute its determinant, right? Well, I can, but I get zero and it doesn't tell us very much. So what we do instead <clears throat> is we take the L, L by L minus, where L is basically, as I said, the rank of the matrix. Um, now, some of those will not be invertible and will give us zero. Um, but, you know, so I get, I get zero and a bunch of other numbers, and I take the greatest common divisor of that. That, it turns out, gives us precisely the multiplicity here, the, so the size of this group here. Um, <clears throat> now. You're actually supposed to use x upper star coordinates instead of x lower star coordinates here. There's a duality that goes on again. But it turns out it doesn't actually matter. And that the fact that it doesn't matter again is this Langland's duality preserves everything observation. It turns out that in terms of coordinates, if I swap the x upper star and x lower star, the, the effect is that I, I, I take the, the adjoint, which just inverts the w, and I also transpose. But of course, transposing, well, that's not going to affect the determinants of the minus you know, as a set. Um, uh, and inverting, well, each element is conjugate to its inverse. And so that doesn't affect the, um, uh, the, that doesn't affect the, um, the answer either. And so we get exactly the same answer, exactly the same number of fixed sets. Not necessarily, it's worth pointing out, it's not necessarily the same group you get here, right? um, or not obviously the same group. Um, <clears throat> because I'm not saying that FW hat is the same, it, it is the FW you get from swapping the duals over, right? swapping the last. Okay, I should probably finish soon. So, um, uh, so oh, I, maybe I'll go through this very quickly because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's sort of a lovely example of that theorem. Um, if I take the, the W element, you can write down its matrix, and then I can write down I minus the matrix. So this is this is the S0, S1, S5, S3, the A1 to the fourth case. Uh, now, when I want to take minus, if I want to get non-zero answers, I, I should clearly remove these two reps here because that's the same as this one here. Um, so now I, I have to think about the, the minus of this bit, right? I need to delete two columns. Well, I can't delete this one because I get zero. Um, so I can delete two of, uh, of the columns over here, but I'm gonna keep at least one of those three twos. So I get two factors of two, 
I can get more, but of course I'm going to then take a GCD of those things. And so the GCD is four. Okay, so that, that one has multiplicity four. And you just get it out by this very simple calculation, you know, using, using that there. So here, if you like, is the answer. Um, <clears throat> we have all of these Carter types. We have the various fixed sets, um, uh, many of them with no multiplicity. So the, the rank, as I said, it, it just comes from the word length. So the word length here is zero, one, two, three, four, and then down to the bottom. You know, you have no torus when the word length is six. And the multiplicities, that's that's these bits here. You know, sometimes you get a Klein four group. The Z here is the center of the Lie group, which is always going to be fixed by the conjugation action. So that's in, that's in everything. So that, that's, that's something you see there. Um, <clears throat> of course, the part of the story I've not told you is, well, you, you know, having found the fixed set, you're not quite done because you have to take the quotient by the centralizer. So we've worked out the fixed set and the centralizer and you just have to put them together in some way. And that's, of course, also an interesting story. Um, uh, so, you know, um, I will skip over this bit um, and just finish by saying, well, yeah. we, this actually tells us what the K-theory is. If you take the extended affine bar group of a Lie group of type E6, which could be either the simply connected or adjoint type, those are two different affine bar groups, but the K-theories will be the same. Uh, it's Z to the 47 in dimension zero and Z to the 11 in dimension one. Uh, and I will finish that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the audience? Um, maybe first we should ask uh, for Roger if you have any comment. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, maybe Jamal has. Uh, uh, yes, I I'm not an expert here, Nick, but I I just try to ask whether there's any like cost geometric version of your duality theorem, like instead of considering this group C star algebra, you can consider that's, something from the algebras. Yeah, I mean that's that's a very interesting question. Um, to which I don't have an answer. <laughs> so um, but but somehow it feels like that the, there ought to be. Right. Um, I, I mean, so I think some people have actually looked at Poincaré duality in um, uh, in the course context, uh, mm -hmm. and so that that may be some way to go towards answering your question. But uh, it's 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 yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so so of course, of course, you know, it, 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 a very interesting question is, you know, how how much can one stretch this idea of duality? You know, how, how general is this? So, of course, I've talked here just about the context of uh, extended affine bar groups, but, you know, what one might wonder if, it, you know, it, is there a notion of Langland's duality that applies beyond that, right? So, so somehow the, 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 the Lie groups themselves, they, they, they appear and they they sort of are, uh, uh, you know that they play this crucial role in terms of giving us this these two, these two dual discrete groups. Um, but you know, it's, it, it, in general, if I have a discrete group, you know, is is there some notion of uh, of a uh, Langland's dual of that? Um, to which the answer probably is no, at least not as a group. But maybe in, maybe there is in some more generalized sense. Yeah, I'm just considering something like the group point case, so you can recover a lot of interesting examples here. Is it, sorry, which, which case? The... I, I mean the group point. Just try to generalize to the group point case. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so so yeah, one might, one might think about group points, yeah. Um, yeah, and so yeah, I mean, obviously, um, yeah, you could do of course, um, course group. So it's an interesting question, is, is there a notion of a, so I suppose what one should do is one should think about a Lie group void, right? you know, whatever that might be. Um, uh, yeah. And, um, uh, uh, and you know, can you get a Lie group void and an affine vowel group void from your Lie group void? Maybe. That's, uh, 
yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I like that idea I'm not sure how hard that will be it might be quite hard but, but, but. <laughs> thank you thank you any other questions or comment uh, so uh, <laughs> Nick so you your example, so the, 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 la, the next, the, the last half of your talk is about uh, E6, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, do you have any plan to uh, discuss E8 or something? Yeah. Well, of course, that's, uh, you know, that, that's the, the obvious sort of next place to go. Um, so, E7 is a case which is uh, self dual, I think, if I remember correctly. That, that, so, so, so the, the Langlands duality, uh, um, you know, is, is, uh, isn't going to do anything extra for you. But yeah, so e, E8 would be the, definitely the, the obvious next place to go with this. Um, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, so the the complex reflection groups made sort of a brief appearance here, but it, it's more than it, it's more than just a coincidence in some sense. The, the, it turns out that complex reflection groups are uh, very closely related to this idea of centralizers in, in, in these these things, in small groups. So, um, uh, you know, the in, in principle, a lot of the the sort of theory and ideas that we've learned thinking about the E6 example should also apply in the E8 example as well, although obviously it gets more progressively more yeah. complicated. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, you did all of these computations by hand or? Um, uh, so, as I said, we, we had sort of Carter as a starting point. Um, uh, yeah. And then we spent we spent a bit of time, you know, playing around on the computer using gap and things like that to try and understand what was going on uh, you know okay. and of course and then you start to spot patterns and so then you go away and you you actually work things out by hand so so yeah i mean in in, in you know in while secretly we might have used gap at times you know in, in the paper the the answers yeah. will actually yeah, be sure, kind sure, of worked, sure. worked out by hand rather than by um, uh, yeah. uh, rather than by just appealing to gap, the answer yeah. is, you know, which somehow is, is not satisfying in a paper. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, okay. Thank you. Uh, are you. there any que are there any questions or comments? Let me see if anything on the chat. No, uh, that's good. Okay. So uh, Okay, and um, in that case, let's thank our speaker again for this wonderful talk. And uh, next week, we will have Valerio Priority from East China Novel University in China, in Shanghai. And, uh,